good stuff that goes with it. I've enjoyed seeing the old airplanes fly again. And uh, I'm, I'm mailing a copy to Bill Gus. Thank you, Rex Hamilton. Rex is responsible for getting me off the dime to do something about the Marine Corps Aviation Association in general and VMF 223 in particular. Wally Henry had known about the movies I took overseas and he told Rex. One day Rex called and said that if I would send him the movies, he would transfer them to videotape, send them back to me for the narrative, and we could show them to you this week. Here they are. They're a little amateurish, but they're better than just sea stories and damn lies. My greatest experience in 223 was one day I was flying over Los Negros in the central Philippines. As I came around, I saw the Jap Betty bomber that had been interrupting our sleep. So here I came around again, guns blazing, and got a big hit in my left wing. I nearly hit the ground, but I was able to get back to our base. I knew that I could not land the plane and had to jump, which I did. Thanks to the guys that you'll see in the picture, the parachute riggers, it worked beautifully. Four years later, my wife Marge, my girl Marge, had a, a wedding dress made from that beautiful piece of silk. And even amazingly, four years ago, our daughter Marilyn was married in that same beautiful wedding dress. Here we go then, fellas, overseas with a Corsair. Here we are on the island of Ifati in the New Hebrides group. Bill Gray and Norm Govro joust in the ocean. They were great friends, only Bill was about half the size of Gov. I don't know how he kept up with him. Bill was later lost on his first combat hop, flying from Green Island with BMF 212. This is a big jungle hunting expedition. Vince Seproviva, Norm Gubro, Bill Gus, Bill Gray, and Jim Sykes. We were using our little 30 caliber carbines. Bill Snatch Evans had the duty and was our driver. He was a rough one too. Really, it's a poor photographer. Heading into the jungle. We had to shed our shoes to cross this little stream, and Semp managed to toss one shoe in the drink. And he later had to retrieve it the hard way. Here he goes. Stalking the jungle chicken, or small fish, whatever presented itself. You can't hardly shoot fish underwater. This is a taro leaf. It's a potato-like plant. Big enough leaves to hide a man, that's Govro. And here we sustain life. Bill Gus takes a swig. Semp shows his hunting prowess. Norm Govro now is making a DuPont spinner. This is a quarter stick of dynamite tossed into a tidal pool. It stuns the fish so they can be collected by hand. Good way to provide for a luau. This is the jungle growth real thick. The vines grow up over the trees even. And 
and it gets dark underneath and limits the hunter's success too. But we didn't do bad. Moon Mullins acquired a horse from an old Frenchman there and feeds it some coconut. And it looks like the horse knows what it's all about. He enjoys it. Coconuts are a lot harder to open than you'd expect. We had some survival training headed up by Frank Scriminger. We were on a 12 to 15 foot platform. The idea was to learn to get in the water with our backpacks and get into our boats and save ourselves. Simp goes off the tower. Gets his boat pack out, but the first mistake he made, he didn't inflate his life vest. And his second mistake, he couldn't swim. He was just thrashing around, and finally we had to go in and rescue him. Regrettably, he later made a water landing off Green Island in 212, climbed out on a wing, the plane sank, and he drowned, needlessly. He finally gets into his boat, but the wrong way. This is Charlie Ricks. He was helping Scriminger, and he did the job right. Jim Sykes gives, tries his hand, checks the May West tubes, protects the jewels, and jumps in. This was good training. I did exactly what you'll see here the next Valentine's Day off Samar in the Philippines. Successfully, I might add. Open the boat pack, pull out the chute, or pull out the boat pack, I should say. Turn on the CO2 bottle and climb in over the small end. That was my son's first swimming pool years later. A bunch of the pool pilots were assigned to VMF 212 and we went to Green Island southeast of Rabal, Boyd McElhaney was our skipper. Wally Henry and Moon Mullins admire our predecessor's aerial handiwork on the big trophy board. We didn't add to it. Here's Hank. Three years later, he was best man at our wedding in Minnesota. Fighting bull pups, 212. Some SBDs coming home and a column of Vs. This is our 212 combat division. Jack Yeager, division leader. Sykes was his young man. Stan Tripod Grunland was section leader, and Hank was his wingman. Here we're in the air toward Rabal. This day, I saw the first aircraft, anti-aircraft fire. It was so close I could hear it. This is the Ropopo airstrip southeast of Rabal. 
There were several airstrips in that country. This is a small volcano east of Raval City at the north end of New Britain Island. Took my own picture in the cockpit. There's Jack Yeager, our division leader in the beautiful Corsair. These are our gun switches, one for each 50 caliber wing gun. And this is the gun sight that seemed to project out into space so we didn't have too much trouble pinpointing what we wanted to hit. And we had two and a half inches of bulletproof glass in front of our heads, too. Here we have more airstrips around Rabal, but they're pretty hard to see. Back on Green Island for the Dawn Patrol, still in BMF 212. Planes and pilot were kept warm and ready for a quick scramble call, which that morning did not come. Here we have sunrise in the tropics. And a pet parakeet, who also likes coconut. You lose your taste for coconut about the second time one falls on your head. They're heavy. Several of the guys had these little birds for pets out there. This is the best half of Squadron 212, Hanks and my wing. After an arduous six to eight weeks in combat, they'd send us to Sydney, Australia for R&R. Well, at least a change of scenery, shall we say. Here we have the Sydney traffic with their fuel shortages. This is a natural gas burner. And the city park. That was near our hotel. How nice. A girl and a friendly one. but not ours. See the world, join the Marines. And cruise boat on the Sydney Harbor. We should have taken one, but didn't. And this is the famous Sydney Harbor Bridge. We'll get another view later. Jim Kent from Wichita Falls, Texas. I knocked around with Jim on this trip, but I found some better company next time. Cute little blonde named Joy. This is a game of bowls. Apparently, they try to come as close to the white ball as possible without hitting it. The green they're bowling on there was just as smooth and flat as a table. And I thought those were old guys playing that game, and now I am one. Here's the Sydney Harbor Bridge again. This was springtime in the Southern Hemisphere. Here's Jim Sykes strolling around. There's Jim Kent talking to the kids, telling them sea stories, no doubt. And here
here, Jim Kent helps the statue remove a splinter. And amazingly, by golly, he found it. Well, us well-behaved flyboys, darn it. Parks, zoos, not necessarily by choice. Here's the bird of paradise flower. I'd never seen one before. Jim Kent was driving. He's a rough driver, too. And we had to drive on the wrong side of the road and the wrong side of the car. So we checked in at the zoo. Kangaroos, we discovered, come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. They're a funny looking beast. <laughs> The koala bears were really cuties. At that time, they could not be exported, but they can now, I see. And here's an elephantine reach for a peanut. Look how he's balanced there. I think Jim Kent was feeding him. And here are some floral gardens, just immaculately groomed with a big floral clock in the middle. And penguins, also cute, flyers they aren't. And Jim Kent enjoys the sunshine all alone, just as Marcia had instructed. He's a good boy. Back to work. We'd been transferred to VMF 223 on Bougainville. And here we are, heading for the briefing tent and then on to the flight line. In the briefing tent, we were briefed by Captain Lewis and Jim Sutherland. Gave us the targets for the day, the best way to get in, and so on. I think my camera may have inspired some of this enthusiasm. Here comes Glenn Amo and others putting their suits on a truck to be taken out to the plains. This is Rebel Atwood, South Carolina boy. He gives Chief Montana a little TLC. He and the plane captain, Slim Hegland, really kept my plane up. And to ensure that, I brought them rot gut from Sydney because I preferred round trips with the chief. They had a mixture that they put on the plane there that really made it shine. And here we are taking the pilots out to the planes in the revetments. And here comes Hank. That's a big airplane for a small man. As a last resort, we had to start the engines with a big rubber band called a bungee. Well, the pilot didn't catch that one on the first go around, so they have to pull the prop through. Let him try it again. We had four or five planes for revetment, so a bombing raid would not get them all. We 
we'd take off or go down the taxiways in the order of our divisions so that we wouldn't jam up. You can tell by the bomb load what we were going to do that day. There goes Hank, 178. It was either muddy or dusty out there. This particular day, as you can see, it was real dusty. Here they are at the takeoff point. The sand was covered with steel marks and matting. And that way it would we could it would support the weight of the planes. Sounded like your tail was falling off though when you landed on it. We made section takeoffs, two at a time. Division or section leader and his wingman. The wingman lifts off first. Here they go, wheels up and away. Here's another section taking off. A Corsair has a long nose and it's just blind on the ground. Well, here we are in the air, all joined up, 16 planes, four four-plane divisions. Half the pilots in the squadron would fly day on, day off. The other half would fly on the off days. Didn't take any pictures while I was uh, doing my assigned bombing, strafing, and general hell raising for obvious reasons. Beautiful airplane. We flew around these big thunderheads rather than through them if we had a choice. And sometimes we didn't. Sometimes we had to go over them. Sometimes, or better, we'd get right on the deck and go under them. Looks like a beautiful day so far. Here's a section coming in to land. Leader breaks off. Here he comes. Wheels and flaps down. Looks like he's landing on Piva South, no mat. Here are some pictures of Piva North on the marts and matting. Here a plane comes back to the rebatment, pivoting into parking position. <coughs> the plane captain guides him in. and spots him. Here's our skipper, Pop Bob Flaherty. I understand he was killed in a car accident a few years ago. He was one fine fellow. When it rained on Bougainville, it damn well rained. Water's standing on the sand. <coughs> Just like a flood. This is the Marine Corps emblem made out of pop bottles driven into sand. That constituted our front yard. And here we have a local artist, an enlisted Marine, I think, and a local model. 
He's a real neat kid, but a little hard to get to smile. Come on, son. Come on. <laughs> there we go. This picture is of a native adult male and is a real typical good drawing. And this is a little teenage girl. She's weaving a basket from native materials, quite naturally. We spent some more time on Bougainville, and then we flew to the Philippines to get closer to the war. Dug out Doug needed our help to guard his convoys. But first, Jack Benny's USO show found us around Christmas time. 1944 it was. Don't know who that girl is. First girl we'd seen in a long time, believe me. But this is Carol Landis. She was a singer and a provocateur. How the boys went for her. In here we have Jack Benny himself on the piano, sort of. And Carol comes back and something a bit more revealing. Very nice. Ooh. Now how that came about, I haven't yet figured out. This is Harry Adler on the harmonica. Believe it or not, he was playing Malaguanian. First time I'd ever heard it. And as I was making this script, I had Malaguanian playing on my CD. And Jack entertains us with his violin. A few squeaks here and a few wisecracks there. And then Carol came back to jitterbug with some of the Marines. Almost too much for that guy. In here we have an artistic snapshot of Carol. On most sunny days, we'd have volleyball games by the dozen. This is a pretty good game here, but it's too fast to name out all, the, call out all the names. Call them out as you see them. I always thought this was a girls game until I got out there in the island and then I discovered it wasn't. And here we have Bill Gus and Delmar Watts, great buddies they were, Entertain on the ocarinas or sweet potatoes. T. Walling's on the left there, and Larry DeCamp on the right at a slingshot. Great music they made, or at least Bill did. <laughs> Here's Larry with his slingshot. Somebody's going to get a rude awakening. Look out. Well, Bill Gus gets a flight from the flight surgeon. Gets a shot from the flight surgeon. This is Francis Bosch, another great guy. No problem. He just collapses. And now we'll have some physical inspections. John McShane here. <laughs> Dick Rose comes in for surgery. Well, World War 
wasn't all hell. We obviously had a little fun. This is the jungle growth at the edge of our base perimeter, about a year after the Buckeye Division had ruined it so we could have an air base. I don't imagine you could tell any difference nowadays. Some of the native lads in the Laruma River. No problem for clothes, everything was 90 degrees. The air, the water, and the humidity. Well, old Jim Sykes touches up his survival knife. These knives were given to us by the Aussies, and I still have mine. They were kind of a small machete. We carried them on our, strapped to our legs. Got to keep the cutlery sharp. Tea walling and welling. Doing a little boxing here for exercise. Keep things lively. T was my wingman in the Philippines. Here we have a little shadow boxing. Looks like the match was about a draw. In the Squadron Christmas Party, 1944. Amazingly, we had beer and ice at the same time. Ask Bob McClellan about icing the beer with a Corsair. He's got a good story. There's Mac. Beer and ice, unusual. Nice can opener, that. There's John McDougall. Jim Sykes and Red Bull Atwood discuss world affairs. And after the party, we had a volleyball game the likes of which you will never see. The teams were a little looser, shall we say. Funny, funny, funny. Had to even get a piece of paper to cover up Bill Gus. He looked terrible. There's Hank in his fancy pants, girls all over him. Bill Gus in almost no pants. Dick Rose does a handstand with help. Mind you now, this is a championship volleyball game. I think that's Bob Shirley commandeering the net. All in a friendly game. There's Hank, Mac. Jim Van Rye has the duty with a Jeep without a starter. So we either had to park it on a hill and or push it. Looks like we're pushing it this time. This is the Billy Mitchell volcano on Bougainville. It would shake us ever so often with earthquakes. You get close enough to it, you could see great boulders and lava rolling down the sides. It's a real interesting volcano, as volcanoes go. Well, it's about Christmas time, <clears throat> and Alfred, Charlie Gangness, blows bubbles with his new Christmas present. He blows the bubble, fills it with smoke, and then drops them like bombs. You can see we were real busy. That's Hank and T. Walling playing cards just behind him. Well, here we have Dick Truesdale getting ready to teach his model airplane to fly.
That's Green Island on our way to the Philippines. That's the top of an old volcano on which we met, spent our tour with 212 a few months previously. We flew two Corsair divisions on a PBJ lead plane. <coughs> Pardon me. The PBJ did the navigating, and we just flew. This is a Hollandia airstrip. We landed between aircraft parked on both sides of the airstrip. Boy, what an opportunity for a massacre. Back in the air, flying on the PBJ. This is Owe. Bill Gus and others getting the evening rations, or a short ration at least. Call out the names as you see them. There's the skipper. These are some pictures Doc Bose took from the PBJ. That's the only picture I have of myself flying. Chief Montana in 426. We had our fun. That's the division out beyond me. Beautiful aircraft. Big belly tank so we could fly long distances. Here we are on Peleliu Island in the Palau group. My brother got shot up and left for dead, helping to take this airstrip just a few months earlier. There's a slightly used Jap hangar. Maybe even you could say well used. And this is Bloody Nose Ridge. A bunch of us went up there, as I look back on it rather stupidly, looking at uh, just what we could see there, Mac McClellan, all kinds of debris. We figured that was a booby trap, so we left it alone. I don't know why we didn't blunder into some others. Coral caves all through that ridge. It's a coral ridge. Big holes in it. There's the blown breech of a gun. Bill Gus pokes around kind of gingerly. Read that one for me. There's a little Jap grenade unexploded. And a 37 millimeter shell, that might have even been one of ours. Bill Gus examines a well-used canteen and a pelvic bone. B.B. Cooley has an ammo clip. Very interesting to us flyboys. There are some unused mortar shells. I don't know whose. Caves all through that porous coral. You can uh, see what problems the Marines had shooting or digging the Japs out. B.B. Cooley shows the Jap sneaker with the typical split toe. Another cave. They steal some of those with bulldozers, I was told. I'm sure glad I was a pilot. On to the Philippines. The war was leaving us behind. We didn't have real targets, but we were bypassed Jap targets. Not too good. My division flew on the left side of one of the PBJ lead planes. Here's a map of the Philippines. We were to be, be based near Giawan at the southern tip of Samar Island. That's Samar, not very far from Tacloban, the first U.S. landings. The VMF 
223 parachute loft going up. I was assigned parachute officer and knew the chutes were not getting repacked often enough for those for that climate, which was every 15 days. Sergeants Roy Tennis and Scott Goodman were the riggers and then some. We conspired to beg, borrow, and steal necessary poles, canvas, and lumber to build a drying loft and packing table. Here we have Pop Flaherty digging mud out of his Jeep wheels. And here is the open air prop shop, at least open air for the time being. They kept them turning anyway. Here's Roy and Scotting on the loft getting ready to pull up the canvas for the drying tower. It wasn't long before all four MAG-14 squadrons were using our loft, which was lucky for me, as mentioned early on. Now they're getting ready to pull a tent, canvas tent, that'll go over the very top of the loft. The chutes are hung vertically to dry them out, and then they're put on a horizontal packing table to be put in the packs that we sat on. Here are three owls, three observation planes in a V formation takeoff. Somebody got a hit. Who was it? This is a Dumbo, a PBY flying boat that we use for rescues, etc. And here's one of Dugout Doug's supply convoys. They went so slow that we just had to circle and scissor like mad just to stay over them. It was very boring duty. But we had to be up there and had to keep alert. Some of the Corsairs coming in. This is Dopey. And I can't remember whose plane it was. This is Captain Curley, but I can't remember his last name. Big, nice, blonde guy. And there's Bill Shanks with double duty. Double duty, a brown nose and a red tail. Rebel Atwood again with my plane, Chief Montana. I've often wondered what happened to the chief. Here's a coral pit. They excavated the coral to put on the runways. Beautiful airstrips. Here we are, scissoring among the clouds over Tacloban Bay. That's about the site of the first landings in the Philippines, where dugout Doug waited ashore. There's a plane scissoring. This is the Dumbo escort mission I had to take out to the western Philippines, the island of Palawan. The PBY is just landing after flying out there for about three hours, nearly half of our gas. There's a leper colony out there. This is it. And they were taking I presume, some medical supplies to those poor folks. But hurry up, will you? The rocks in this seat pack are getting pointeder and pointeder. Well, finally he gets underway. The water must have been rougher than it looked, or he tried to pull it off. Anyway, he sure banged it a few times. I went through flight school in PBYs, but they're not for me. I should have used slow motion taking these pictures to reduce the jerkiness, but I didn't realize the problem then.
The B-24s on Samar sure had some pretty girls. Liberty Bell, round trip ticket, interest in that was. Well, here's Maiden Montana. She appealed to this old Montana Marine, but one day she hit a hill and didn't come back. And my plane captain told me that Chief Montana sulked for days. Here they are, taking off for another mission, right over our beachfront campsite in the flare angle at the east end of the strip. That's why we eventually had to move. Remember the B-24 that hit the road grader one morning? Jeepers, that was awful. I came home without exec Bob Teller's airplane one day, and damn lucky to get home at all. Here we have Pop Flaherty and Doc Bosch playing a little gin rummy. Good game, that. Uh-oh. Looks like the flight surgeon's gonna gin. Yep, he wins. Well, Mac was writing to one of his sweeties and figured I was trying to read over his shoulder. But that's not the case. His writing was too bad. I couldn't understand it. Well, here's Bob Shirley and Jim Van Rye, Gene Proulx and Ralph Staven relaxing at our beachside cottage. This is the best place we ever lived. Nice beach. Go out and snorkel a little in the afternoons. But eventually moving day came and we had to leave. There's Doc Bose. There's our Philippine houseboy. I cannot remember his name. When he took care of our laundry, I don't know where he got it done, but he'd take it one day and bring it back nice and clean the next. He could really climb those coconut trees, too. There's old notches on the tree, man-sized notches, so they could go up and harvest the coconut from time to time. But that little guy had to take pretty big steps to go up there and cut our shortwave radio antenna down. We'd gotten a pretty nice radio in Sydney. We could listen in to Tokyo Rose and pick up some things from the States. Philippine males always carried their bolos, usually on their left hips. You seldom see one without that bolo knife. Here we are loading up. You learn to keep all your gear in four or five pieces so that you could toss it at a moment's notice on the a truck or something and go somewhere else. Welcome to Typhus Flats. What a place. Hank just couldn't be real unhappy. Real unhappy. And Bill Gus tries to bounce an ax off a coconut log. You can't chop those miserable logs. Ed Wozniak admires the silly scene. There's Ralph Staven. He was to be our new tent mate for this tour. No, I don't want your picture. Here's Mac stepping out our tent space. A nice piece of real estate in the coconut plantation. Alfred and our houseboy helped clear the ground, get everything set up. Up goes the tent.
Hank and our house, uh, pardon me, that's uh, Alfred and our houseboy. And who else but Jim Sutherland would have a bunch of porters for his deer? There goes Jim ahead of the bunch. Well, this is meal time. This is after we nearly starved to death a few weeks earlier. I can't call the names fast enough, so holler them out, please. There's Yuki on the right, Gene Yukina. Well, this is a safe way to do dishes out in that country. You sterilize them before and after you eat. Pretty efficient, though. No, B.B. Cooley isn't going after coconuts yet. Just climbed up to take some pictures. Charlie Ganguth and Ralph Staven enjoy the only private shower in the pilot's area. We had a big tarp up there to run water into a rain barrel and keep it full. The rain kept it full. The sun warmed the water, so we always had a warm shower after flying. This process was sometimes known as dropping the soap. Well, the officer's country got re eventually rebuilt. Looked pretty good after we were there for a month or two. It was sure miserable to begin with, though. Well, Jim Van Rye saves off an invisible whisker or two. Is this Captain Tedro? I'm not sure. And I'm not sure who I'm playing checkers with. But it looks like I've got a problem. A real problem. Well, here's Jim Van Rye and Gene Prule, Dick Truesdale back there, printing up their shoes. They must be thinking of R&R. &R. Where'd you guys go? Hong Kong? Some sat on a proud experience, but one I'd just as soon not try again. Made too many mistakes to survive another one. Well, coconut trees aren't all bad. Here comes the CF, the C-54, to take Don McDougall and myself east across the wide Pacific via Enoetok and Pearl. Adios, Samar. And VF, VMF 223 have enjoyed you all. Last trip down the Guiawan airstrip. Sunset flying toward Enoetok. Sunrise, I should say. Here we are on the ground at Anahuit Talk, checking the engines a little bit. I just hope they keep turning. The palms of my hands sweat all the way home, never before and not since. And here we are over Boulder Dam flying out of El Toro. I guess that's proof I got home.